very good evening to all our audience at Globespan 24-7 as we come to you on our Monday night program. We want to thank Nohar Singh for making this platform available, and of course, to Devin Bisu, our technical specialist. We want to thank our sponsors, who has been carrying us for many years, well, many months now. And we want to encourage all of you out there um, to please chip in to help us continue this program. Just over a year ago, we had the president of Guyana on this program, and I started the program by telling him that he was born on May 25th, which was the day before independence. He rightly corrected me and says, no, he was born on April 25th. So today, Mr. President, today's your birthday. So on behalf of Globespan 24-7, Noar Singh, Devin Bisu, and all of us here at Globespan, we want to wish you a very, very happy birthday. And may God continue to bless you with um, good health, strength, wisdom, and understanding as you lead our nation. So again, Mr. President, Hail. happy birthday to you. This evening... Hail to the chief. Yes, Dr. Rose? I said hail to the chief. Yeah. And this evening, we are very honored to have the first time a very outstanding son of Guyana. He's no stranger to us. He was the former Auditor General of Guyana from 19... 91, I believe, to 2004. And then he left Guyana for greener pastures, I presume, then returned to Guyana to be with us. So tonight, we want to welcome Mr. Anand Gulseran. Mr. Gulseran, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and with me, of course, Dr. Rose, welcome. Thank you, Charles, and welcome, Mr. Gulseran. Thank you. Mr. Gosran, you, of course, to be the Auditor General, you have to be an accountant, right? And um, I know, um, I guess your buddies who study with you, like maybe Komal Samaru and, and Christopher Ram and those guys, what caused you to get into the accounting profession? That's a, that's a good question. It was never my first choice. It was never my first choice. And... Um, well, you know, I got married early, I had two children, came up very early in my early 20s, and um, I really struggled, and um, I decided that, well, let me study on my own. And um, I, I had a background in mathematics, so I thought that maybe the accounting field would be appropriate for me. So I started to study, you know, part-time at home. Um, and, you know, the ACC has four parts, you know, or levels, level one, two, three, four. So it was a struggle to work and study and to raise a family. But nevertheless, I was able to make it. Um, when I reached the final, I got a, a I got a, a grant or a scholarship. I was working with the MMA, so I I got a grant to go and finish off my studies, which I did in six months in London, in 1986, and that's how I became an accountant. So, who are some of your contemporaries? I mean, studying with you together, Barty Sakai, I believe. They were all senior to me. Oh, they were. Uh, Christopher Ram was senior to me, Badal was senior to me, Kumal Samaru was senior to me. And remember, I was studying on my own quietly, like sitting and waking up in the midnight and, you know, burn that midnight oil to study with, and attending to the family. And I was, I was a school teacher at that time, so it worked. So when, you, for me. so when you came back from England as an ACCA, you continued to work at MMA. What was your progression after that? Well, uh, I continued to work at the MMA. That was in 86. And then um, sometime in 87, um, the Auditor General then, Pat Farnham, he offered me the position of deputy. And I accepted it. So in December 1987, I joined the audit office as deputy. Then having served three years, um, 
I was recommended to replace. Uh, well, Mr. Farnham recommended that I, I, I be appointed substantively upon his retirement. And Mr. Hoyt accepted the recommendation and appointed me. And that's how I became Auditor General. Okay. And over the years, how was it as the Auditor General of Guyana? What were some of the challenges that you faced? The first challenge had to do with um, trying to restore public accountability because everything had grown to a halt in 1981. And we are talking about 1991, 10 years. How do we how do we move the process forward? Is there any way we can um, restart the process, given the gap? And then we had to address what can be done about the gap, and there was nothing that could have been done. Records were not there. Um, computerized system had, had broken down. At that time, it was IBM. It was an IBM computer that had crashed, and there was no way the accounts for the 10 years could have been put together, despite the fact that um, I had seconded an officer from the audit office to help the Ministry of Finance. So the big challenge, what do we do? So I advocated that we restart the process um, with effect from 1992, and I outlined a, a plan how we should do it. Um, the then Minister Carl Grenis had, had accepted the plan in principle. Um, but the difficulty was to get the Ministry of Finance and all the accounting officers and everybody to embrace this plan. Um, and so election came around, and the PPP won. So I approached luncheon and I laid out my plan to him. How to restart the process? I said, let us start 1992 moving forward and uh, let us have a task force to look at the backlog years. But we can't, we can't go back to 1981 and we are 10 years away. It doesn't make sense. And then, so the accountant general at that time didn't support the idea. The secretary. What was it? Um, Secretary of Treasury. Secretary of Treasury, H.O.S. Thompson, and their congressman was um, Eddie Lane. They all rejected the proposal that accounting has to be done sequentially, one year after one year. I said, well, suppose um, you have a building or you, you have a manufacturing entity and you have a fine, everything burned. So there's no way you can reconstruct. How are you going to move forward? You have to start from scratch. You got to start from the beginning and you have to make certain assumptions, you know, and then you move forward. So I had a tremendous amount of resistance. But one of the good things about lunch, and he supported it, he asked the accountant general what level of accuracy with what my proposal for restart would be achieved. Let us say we start the process in 1992. The accountant said, oh, this is, you, you know, um, the accounts are going to be meaningless without brought forward balances and without all the cumulative arrangements from 1982 to onwards, and the accounts would be flawed and what have you. So Luncheon asked him in my presence, what level of accuracy would be achieved if we were to restart the process from 1992? The accountant general said 60 to 70% level of accuracy. The 1992 accounts will have, well, based on his assessment, would be 60 to 70% accurate. So here was a big one. London said, with an accuracy of level of 60 to 70 percent, would that not be better than having no accounts? Mm -hmm. 
the Accountant General went silent. Next day, instructions were issued for the restart of the process. Now, how, how do I get a cooperation from the Accountant General, the Finance Secretary, all the accounting officers, all were resisting. So I had to blaze the trail with a couple of officers and so on. We, we took on the task, you know, almost single-handedly. We actually helped to produce, we helped to produce the draft, the accounts uh, from the Ministry of Finance and all the various ministries. And I had an IBM 286 computer clone at that time. This was 1991. Mm -hmm. And I used, I got the staff to help me and we used a computer and that time was um, not a spreadsheet application that we have now. It was Lotus 123. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, that. yeah, Lotus 123. <laughs> <laughs> and there is it, we start, we started to prepare the accounts. We prepared, we actually prepared the accounts from the draft that they submitted. And up to today, um, the audit office um, prepares their accounts from the draft, which you know, which is generally not the norm, but we do it up in order, and it continued up to today. So we started the process. The accounts were issued in September 2000, and no, the accounts were issued in September 19. We are talking about 92 accounts, 93. September 9th, nine months after the close of the year. Um, the, the minister then was uh, Sri Chan, Sri, you know, the subject, well, he was acting minister, uh, Sri Chan, it was presented to Sri Chan. And that was it, how we restarted. Because um, Asghar Ali was on leave at that time, he was a minister. So Sri Chan received a report. And it was a big su success for the audit office to have taken on this task. A few officers under my supervision, we did it. But when the accounts went to the Public Accounts Committee, PAC, for examination, uh, Dr. Kenneth King, the late Dr. Kenneth King, was the chairman of the PAC. And he took me to task. He actually put me on trial <laughs> for producing accounts that what he considered. Well, well, he was taking the side of the, the accountant general and accounting officers. I think I wrote something like that in, in today's article. He took me to, he put me on trial. He put the audit office in trial and he encouraged uh, the accountant general, everybody to disagree with the report. So, so much so that I, I took the decision to not to attend any more PSC meetings. So I declined attendance. So he finalized the report. And you can look at that report. Um, 1992 PSC report, you can look at it. Then he, he issued a 1993 report, the PSC report, based on my report, which was as critical as the 1992 report. And if you read the two reports, which were issued one um, in, 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 within within a one month period, the ninety two report was issued in some time, but one month after the ninety three. And if you read the two reports, you will see a, a three hundred and sixty degrees about turn, praising the original, praising the report. You know why? Ninety two. 1992 were the accounts of the of the PNC at that time, and he was a minister of the PNC. 1993 accounts were the accounts of the PPP. So you see, it was all politics. So it wasn't, and and that's the problem, Mr. Gulser, and that's what I want to talk about. How how we t we still understand that these public report from the, the general goes to the public accounts committee. And their public outcry on the hearing that this went wrong, that went wrong. 
No one is held accountable. What's the purpose of having the PSC addressing these, these reports? That is all politics again. And if you've been following up my articles, you, would you cannot have a situation where the last report of the PAC was issued in 2017 in respect of the years 2012 to 2014. We are in 2022, and we are talking about PAC backlog accounts um, examination going back to 2015. The PAC currently is looking at the combined years 2015 to 2018. Now, the Auditor General report for 2020 was issued September last year. They should have been looking at that. Now, how would you be able to hold people accountable if you if your the work of the PAC is uh, six or seven years in arrears, people move on. Accounting officers move on. They're not there to answer for what has happened. And how do you take action based on a report relating to five or six or seven years? What action can you take? You know, after the PSC issues its report, the Ministry of Finance normally would issue a Treasury memorandum setting out what actions the government proposes to take or has taken in relation to the findings and recommendations of the PSC. What action? So what is likely to happen maybe 2015 to 18? All things being equal, would be issued maybe in another year within the next year. So we, you know, what really, what what really can you do with the PSC report? It's meaningless to my mind if it is not if the work of the PSC is not up to date. And that's what I've been writing all the time. But what is happening is um, political squabbling at the level of the PSE at the moment. What is your recommendation? My recommendation, in fact, one, um, when when um, the government changed in 2020, I, I issued a few articles in which I said, look, you are seven years in arrears. This new PSC that was formed in, in 2020 after the election, you're seven years in arrears. Why don't you start by looking at the most recent Auditor General exactly. report and have a subcommittee of the PSC looking at the backlog years? Because that's an academic exercise to go back. So, all right, for the sake of completeness, you're going to set up a subcommittee to look at the backlog year. But the main PSC, the full PSC, should look at the latest report. And that's that's the solution to the problem. And what what happened to that recommendation? Well, I can only write in the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the authority to uh, to recommend and for the government to take action. I I only write in the newspaper, so it's for them to take it or leave it. Um. So that's where we are. If the if the if the if the PSC at this moment. If the PSC had completed its, its examination of the 2020 accounts, then appropriate action could have been taken to remedy all the deficiencies, right? And to 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 take to appropriate sanctions against those who are responsible for mismanagement, fraud, and what have you. You can't you can't talk about taking action based on accounts that are seven years old, six years old. Before doctor, it, before it, doctor. It would have been overtaken by time. All, all, everything would have been overtaken by time. Before Dr. Rose come on, Mr. Gosran, do you think both the PP and the PNC are capable to stressing this out, to having no um, accountability per se? I mean, I know it's a political question, but as you said, you, your recommendation is very sound in my view. Let's start with the latest report and then have a subcommittee to go back in prior report. So we are up to date. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That fallen deaf here. 
do you think both political parties are two p in the same pod? I don't know. Well, my resounding answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they 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 are both culpable. They are culpable. They are both guilty. And you know, in fact, I was thinking today. Um, when we talk about transparency, accountability, good governance, both governments, PPP, PNC, they hate those words. They see, they see transparency, good governance, and proper accountability as an unnecessary evil, if I may put it that way, as a unnecessary nuisance in you know in their scheme of things they don't regard they don't have any regard for transparency accountability and good, good governance all the priority the, their primary motive is to stay in power remain in power win the next election and what have you they don't care about you know how public resources are spent they don't care about taxpayers' money. That's a very damaging That's statement here, Mr. Gosaran. Dr. Rose? Yes, Mr. Gosaran. Good evening again to you, sir. During your tenure as auditor from 1990, I think you said, to 2004. So this means that you served both the PNC and the PEP. Did you uncover any major corrupt practices? And if yes, did you recommend charges or penalties? Oh yes, every year, 93, 92 report, I think sometime in 93 there was this gold scam. I don't know if you remember, 93, we did an investigation on, about the gold scam, and then the milk scam, then the dolphin scam, then the Essequibo Road Project scam. Yeah. And the, the World Bank uh, had to pull the plug and cancel the project. And um, wildlife, wildlife. The, um, you can go through all the reports from 92 to 2004. Unfortunately, the audit office website, for whatever reason, hasn't got the 1993 and 1994 reports. They have 92 and then they skip 93, 94, and then 95, way down to... Um, present day 2020. But yes, we, you know, and that was one of the reasons because I'm not diplomatic in whatever I have to say. I say it like it is. And you know that as accountants, we 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 say it like it is. If you breach the rule, you breach the rule. There is nothing diplomatic other than saying, you know, that's it. You know, you have to say, speak the truth. And this is um, on the Chetty Jagan, I had a lot of support. He, he was very supportive of me. Um, in 1993, in 92, when Asgard took over, he, um, he, he supported the audit office initially because he was appointed and he told uh, Chetty Jagan, look, um, you've appointed me and I don't know anybody. I just came from Jamaica. And Chetty told me, go and see one person. Go and see Anand Gosran. So on the first day, eight o'clock in the morning, he called me and he said, "What sort of so and so you have to fight down the PNC? I'm going to bring the, I'm going to bring the cameras and I will have the television and I'm going to come and see you to show to the world that uh, you know he's supportive of me." And I said, "No, Minister, I'm coming to your office. It's not right that you should come." So I went and I saw him and he repeated that, and that that was it. After then, what happened? Then uh, the new minister, um, the, the current vice president, initially was supportive, but then once the reports are critical, they hate you. And I, am, I was never prepared in any way to compromise on my work. And so the, let, let, the, go ahead, go ahead. the tension built up, built up until it reached a maximum point in 2004, and I had to call it a day. Let me ask you this question, since you said that you're not, you were never willing to compromise. Many viewed you as being very honest and straightforward 
in whatever you did during your 14 year tenure as an account auditor general. But my question to you is this, were you ever pressured by any government official to slant your report in their favor? No, no, they, no, they, I was never under pressure to, to compromise, but I was under pressure after I issued a critical report, you know, everybody, you know, I remember um, the former president calling me several times to berate me. In fact, I wrote a letter to that effect um, when just before I resigned. Um, but prior to the issuing of my report, uh, nobody tried to influence me to compromise on what I'm doing. Is after I would have issued a report, then everybody got vexed. You know, they don't want to talk. They, you know, you're kind of you become a, an enemy of the state. You know. Okay. Do you think should there be an independent oversight committee or a body to deal with government officials who commit fraud? Well, we had this so cool. We had this uh, um, Sarah. In fact, when I did, I did four forensic audits in 2015, and all um, well, four, one had to do with Marriott, one, the other one had to do with Nissil, third one, EPA, and the fourth one, Forestry Commission. I did those four. Well, the Marriott Hotel and Nissil and perhaps uh, Forestry Commission, there was evidence of so many things. So Sokul was looking at those reports. In fact, I, I, I was actively involved in ass assisting Sokul to sift out all the issues. And many of the issues went to the police um, advisor, who is now the chair of GCOM, Claudette Singh. She was a police advisor. And I had several meetings explaining everything and so on. But then nothing happened. Um, then we had, we had that, that's so cool. Then we had Saru Sar and then Sarah under Clive Thomas. I had a lot of discussion with Clive Thomas and so on. Again, nothing happened. So it's not want of effort. To, to deal with all the irregularities and acts of mismanagement in government. It's not want of effort in my part, on my part, because I said it like it is in my report. I assisted in whatever way possible. I assisted, I, I, I assisted the investigative agencies, Soku and Zara. There was nothing else I could do. And then 2015, it's not that I was auditing, I was just, I was just um, contracted to, to, to do the forensic audit. So uh, my report only, uh, I could have only recommended, you know, action. Okay, uh, Mr. Golsaran, as you know, and Guyanese know in general, this small man has been charged for stealing a penny. Why is it that no one has been charged in the government for stealing millions of dollars? Politics again, I guess. Politics. Um, whenever, whenever senior officials who are closely aligned to the political directorate, whether it's PNC or PVP, there's always that tendency to circle the wagons. I remember once someone had said, no, no, the party's interests come first. You can't do it. If you do it, you will, um, you will expose the party. The party's interest comes first. I heard it from, from the mouth of the top person. Many economic experts have concluded that Guyana from day one has been rich in agriculture, minerals, timber, and everything else. Mr. Golsaran, with only less than 800,000 people, why Guyana is so poor and is considered the third poorest country in the Western Hemisphere with all those resources? 
Why Gaina is so poor? Well, my my simple answer is that uh, yes, we have all these resources. Um, to what extent we have been exploiting them? Uh, I'm talking about prior to the oil for the benefit of the Guyanese population. Um, you know, governments love to say, well, this is the largest budget ever. So they take taxpayers' money and they spend it on, uh, and in some cases, failed projects. And if you, if you read last week's article, the, I, I spoke about the Skellen Estate, Estate Project. I spoke about the laptop, one laptop. I spoke about fiber optic cable. I spoke about Nissil being a, considered a parallel treasury, using money to do all sorts of things, you know, without the approval of parliament. So the question is, with all the resources we have, the country remains poor because the, because the politicians make it poor, make the people poor. Nothing filters down. Do you think the one laptop policy was good for the country? It had to be linked with the fiber optic cable because you can't. Now, just where I'm living in Eccles, there is this huge tower, you know, the, the fiber, you know, to, to relay. You know, the, the idea was to bring the internet from Brazil to a relay system of towers. So just opposite me got the towers, and they must have had hundreds of these towers all over now. They're, they're white elephants. All, at the top of the tower, you have just a red light blinking to provide uh, some signal to aircraft. So it was um, it was a major disaster. The, the one laptop program was the computers were, were bought through a grant of 50 million yuan from um, the Chinese Development Bank, Exim Bank of China. It wasn't a loan, it was a grant, but the loan was for the fiber, fiber optic cable was like 215 million yuan, and that collapsed. That collapsed. Um, Why? Well, not the right people, and not the right people when they were you know, a lot of things has to do with feasibility studies. If you don't do proper feasibility studies and you embark on a program, what is going to happen? There was no feasibility study for the Chadijagan International Airport project. And after 10 years, this airport is still to be completed and it might cost over 200 million US. I'm not sure about the fiber optic cable. And you see, to run cables, to run the cable from Letem, Bovista, we are, across. And if you, if, you, if you look at the trail, if you, if you drive from Linden towards um, Letem, you would see the terrain is such, you know, that if you're gonna lay the cable, when rain falls, the whole place, you know, everything's washing away. And so a proper feasibility study had to be undertaken, how you will, how you will run the cable. And they went ahead and it collapsed. Uh, as you know, my good friend is the CEO for Gaisuku. And my colleague here, here, Charles, did a fantastic audit of the Human Resources Department. Mm -hmm. but, but do you think sugar is going in the right direction as we speak? Well, to the extent that you can't compete on the world market, if your cost of production far exceeds the price you're getting for the sugar, does it economically make sense? Does it? So this thing was known, the, 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 the European Union preferential treatment under the Lomi Convention for ACP countries. Everybody knew that um, in 2001, 2002, that the preferential price for Ghana sugar would have been 
would have been given up because of the World Trade Organization rules, you know. And that Ghana had to compete on the world market for for for, for, the, for the sale of its sugar. So we knew that since 2001 or 2002. I think three countries had filed um, uh, the um, filed challenge the um, European Union um, preferential treatment with the with the World Trade Organization. And it's obvious that the once the matter goes there, you know. Uh, the EU will have to uh, abide with the ruling, which and the ruling says that that's uh, contrary to the to the um, to the um, World, TA, World, World Trade Organization rules. And so we knew um, since 2002, but we made no attempt. In fact, we had known earlier that 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 would have happened. Maybe we had known since the late 90s, but we took no action. You know why? Because uh, we believe that we would be in power in perpetuity. And that we have control over the Treasury so every year we can bail Gaisuko with something like nine billion um, Guyana dollars. That was the reason why, why little or no effort was made to diversify, to to do something. Now St. Kitts, Barbados, Trinidad, all these sugar producing countries in the Caribbean, they took appropriate action. In case close on the sugar industry, Barbados scale down, Trinidad scale down. Eventually, they all close, and they try in their own way to diversify. What did we do? We stayed with sugar because we derive our political support from sugar workers. We are in charge, and we expect to be in charge in perpetuity. We have control over the treasury. We will find nine billion or whatever it is every year to give to guys. Do you think before my colleague comes back on? Do you think Apna should have closed four sugar estates without providing alternative employment to the workers? Yeah, I I did a paper for cabinet on that matter. I did a paper for cabinet when when the proposal was to close. And that paper spoke about um, giving each of a worker three to five acres of land to um, to cultivate and for the government to provide extension services to facilitate. I went to canal number one. I spoke to some farmers. They, they said they would be happy if they give up their job as cane cutters uh, in exchange for a uh, say a three, acre, three acres of land to do farming. And once the government provide the necessary support, like, you know, the, the farm to access, no, uh, what do you call it, farm to market access and things like that, and extension services and so on. So yes, the, the APNO made a mistake by closing the sugar estate without providing alternative employment. And the way I had seen it is that you had to give them land and provide. Like what happened in Blackbush Boulder in the 60s, in the 50s? People were encouraged to go and live on the land and they were provided with all sorts of support. And that was in the 60s, early 60s. 1964 election, government change, and the project was killed. Same thing with the MMA. The MMA started out in 1977, in the 70s. Government changed in 92. MMA was killed. Or it barely survived. So it's all politics of revenge. My last question to you before my colleagues comes in. What recommendations slash suggestions would you make to the sugar industry as it stands now? The simple answer is if you can't produce, you can't bring down the price of sugar and the, the cost of production so as to at least break even. 
you know, to at least break even, then does it make sense to produce sugar? Does it make sense? Are you going to burden the other taxpayer, the treasury, by bailing, bailing out the sugar industry every year to the tune of billions of dollars? So the, the, the question is, what do we do? Perhaps we could produce sugar for local consumption, which um, the price would not be affected by the world market price unless people start to bring in the sugar from other countries. So what we can do is to develop secondary industries to take off the sugar, like chocolate, sweets, you know, all those things that people overseas we can refine the sugar and sell, and you know the, the calculation has to be done in such a way that well at least you can break even so secondary industries to take off sugar like as i said chocolate factory sweet factory whatever sugar can be used to make products for export um the other thing is, uh, why don't we have a sugar refinery? And if, if, if the cost is such that we can br at least break even on the refined sugar, so be it. Thank you. Over to you, Charles. Um, Mr. Gosran, we'll take a short commercial break, and when we come back, we'll continue the discussion. Okay. Guyana Independence is in May, and Travelspan has the cheapest fares. Fly with non-stop and direct flights to Guyana on American, JetBlue, or Caribbean Airlines. Fares start from 185 one-way and 414 round-trip to Guyana. And from Guyana, one-way fares start from 251 and round-trip from 456. These are non-stop and direct flights to and from Guyana. Call Travelspan for these cheap fares. In the U.S., call 718-845-0437. In Georgetown and West Coast Demerara, call 227-1701. And in Burbese, call 337-4287. Travelspan is serving the community for over 27 years with offices in Queens, Georgetown, Burbese, West Coast Demerara, and Trinidad. When you purchase at one office, you can reconfirm your flight at any other Travelspan office for all your convenience. Call Travelspan today and book your flights now. It's Wendy's wedding the done. Right now my belly burning for the seven curry. But then fancy people just call it vegetarian food. I just call it seven curry. Order your 7 curry or vegetarian box today from allfromonesupplier.com and get free shipping throughout the U.S. The 2022 competition is in Cancun on July 28th to August 1st. Who is going? The Duck and the Curry going for sure, plus Raymond Ramnarine, Terry G, young upcoming dancer and singer Ariana, Randy Reckless and the Reckless Tassa Group. The competition for the best tasting duck is in Cancun for 2022. Friends and families, make this a reunion. Family and friends meet up in Cancun on July 28th. Enjoy your culture, your music, and your duck. For more info, call Travel Span at 212-430-865, that is 212-430-865. In Canada call 6475576200, in Trinidad call Amarils at 6451604, and in Guyana 2271701 or visit us at travelspan.com. Janam, janam ka saath hai. 
Bollywood on the Beach is a family and friends event with Bollywood Entertainment. July 14th to the 18th enjoy a five days and four nights all-inclusive vacation with your family and friends and your culture. Performers from India, Pakistan, Trinidad and Guyana will be live at the resorts with your favorite Bollywood songs. In Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Stay in the family section or in the adults only section and enjoy over 12 restaurants, 11 bars, 7 pools, play areas, spas, and exclusive beach area. Your all-inclusive Bollywood on the beach vacation is from $1,095 per person which includes your airfare, transfer, hotel, and all you can eat and drink. Make it a family and friends reunion in Punta Cana Dominican Republic. Flights available from all U.S. cities, Canada, Trinidad, and Guyana. For rates, date, and more info, call Travelspan at 212-243-0865. In Canada call 6475576200. In Trinidad call Amarils at 6451604. And in Guyana 2271701 or visit us at Travelspan.com. Dave's West Indian has all of your West Indian groceries and items. They carry curry powders, pepper sauces, sodas, snacks, and much more. Dave's West Indian is the choice for West Indian items. Visit Dave's at 11808 Liberty Avenue or call 718-843-3283. And for Dave West Indian products online, visit allfromonesupplier.com for free shipping throughout the United States. Dave's West Indian is a proud sponsor of Travel Span's Curry Duck Curry in Punta Cana. Looking for a reliable contractor? Look no further. Call Sings Construction today. At Sings Construction, they can cover all your jobs, interior and exterior. We cover painting, bathrooms, kitchen, doors, windows, tiles, brick, decks, flooring, and concrete. Call Naresh Singh today for your free quote at. 9172384180 that's 9172384180 Folks, the Ness Restaurant is the place to dine for Guyanese and Caribbean dishes. It is the best restaurant in Queens. The staff is courteous and Dave the owner is always there to welcome you. So for a memorable dining experience, visit the Ness Restaurant located at 12717 101 Avenue, South Richmond Hill. Go and make a reservation today or take out. Call 718-847-4035. Welcome back to our audience as we have with us the former Auditor General of Guyana, Mr. Anand Gulsaran. Mr. Gulsaran, you work, um, from the beginning you told us you were appointed Auditor General, but well, you became Deputy Auditor General in Mr. Farnham years, and then became the Auditor General under President Hoyt. You work also under President Jagan, under President um, uh, Jack Dale, and so on. Did any administration ever tell you that stop this audit you're doing? The answer is no, I was too strong. So no one ever said to stop this audit? I was, I had, you know, I had strength of character to tell them nobody can tell me how to do my work. And nobody can interfere in my work because uh, that uh, the auditor is the whole of a constitutional office and is under the direction and supervision of no person or authority. I would just quote that on them anytime anybody wants to interfere. Excellent. And in your in your time as Auditor General and within the body politics of Guyana, you work under did you work under President Burnham? Hey. Uh, he, well, 1985 he died. I was at the MMA. Oh, so he did work at MME under him. In fact, he, in fact, he, the, he, he came to the MME uh, just about a week before he died, and he, he was, um, wasn't that well, and there was his guest house, and he stayed. And it's from, from there he took in, and the helicopter flew, flew him to Georgetown, and that was it. Mm. He went into surgery and never recovered. In your opinion, who was Guyana's best president? Good question. Well, I had a brief stint with Burnham while I was at the MMA, and he 
I had a meeting once with him when he said, um, if the MMA could gear itself in such a way that uh, it can service their two IDB loans, uh, in this way, um, the government will be freed up to take more loans. And I thought that was a, that was a, um, a wise, you know, that was a good way of thinking. And I suggested to the management of the MMA that we, you know, and I did the calculations to show that if we were, if we were to recover, if we were to collect all our rates and taxes, drainage and irrigation charges, as well as over 37,000 acres of land, we will have enough money to service alone. But everybody looked at me and laughed. You know, nobody wanted to work hard. And I used to go out there uh, to every farmer and, uh, with my receipt book and collect rates and taxes from them. And then, man, and I, I had to submit a weekly report to Mr. Hoyt. And he would look at it and he would say, Ben, Ben was a general manager, Ben Carter. This is not good enough. The next week there was an improvement. He said, this is still not good enough. But I knew to my own heart that he was pleased, but he would never tell you, lest you, you get complacent. So I, you know, I feel that I was doing a good job, job at the MME and Mr. Hoyt was kind of happy, but he would never praise you. Yes, Mr. Hoyt appointed me, so after, well, let's go. We, we talk a little about Burnham. Chetty was like a father figure for me. Yeah. He was like, he treated me like a son. I had all the support from him. But having said that, um, and then I had, I, I served under former President Jacques Dale and even under Janet Jagan. But if I were to rate who I thought was the best president, I would say I'm Desmond Hoyt. For the simple reason he's a disciplinarian. He made me cry once at the MMA. He made me cry once when, you know, when he was not satisfied with the answer and he, 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 you know, he spoke harshly to me and I cried. He, he appointed me as Auditor General. He believed in professionalism and he was a disciplinarian. So in my book, Desmond Hoyt was the best president. Chetty was a nice person, very, very humane. But when it comes to running government, Desmond Hoyt stood out among all of them. Have you included our current president in that list? Or it's too early That's, to tell? It's too early to tell. OK. Mr. Gosrand, you wrote um, in one newspaper that corruption is a human rights issue which ought to be recognized as such by states, the business community, and civil society. Do you want to expound on that a little? I seem to read it somewhere. You wrote, wrote it. You, you did that. Yeah. You said it. Yeah, yeah, I was going through some articles, and yes, and I, 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 I came across it. Well, if you go back to the statement made by Kofi Annan when he signed the, when in the forward to the, um, in the, the UN Convention Against Corruption, he said, in, and I had some quotation, he said, uh, corruption is an insidious plague. It's a cancer that destroys society. It robs the poor. It enriches, it, um, it benefits the rich at the expense of the poor and things like that. So it's against that background that I would have written something like that. You, um, you think both all of our administration, and I'm, I'm not picking up PP or PNC and APNU AFC, has all, in your view, has all our administration corrupt? Well, Corruption is uh, is um, very difficult to measure. You know, it be given the opaque nature and so on, and you can only look at peripheral evidence to suggest um, that yes, corruption has improved, um, has is on the right. So we have to look at the corruption perception index, 
um, which uh, Transparency International every year they put out. And um, it started with, uh, I think Ghana started to be rated in 2005 on the CPI. And I think we, we scored 27 out of 100. That's in 2005, 2006, around the same time, right through to 2015. We were hovering between 27, 28, and 20. And then in 2015 or 2016, we had a sudden jump to 34. So and we became we better. became a more corrupt society in 2015. Is that no, right? no, no. We became cleaner. Oh, cleaner. Yeah. Remember, yeah. yeah. Remember, it's 27. You're scoring. You're scoring out of 100. So 27 out of 100, 28 out of 100. Okay. Now okay. we jumped to 34. So we became a better nation with less corruption. That is, and uh, it had to do with um, a number of measures that. Um, um, Granger administration had taken, like the anti-money laundering legislation was passed, the setting up of SARA, setting up of SOCO, um, restoration of the Auditor General's report um, was delayed for some time, and many other. And in fact, I listed them down in one of my um, articles, and that resulted when 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 Transparency International looked at the various initiatives that took place following the um, the change in administration in 2015. The CPI, Ghana CPI jumped to 34. Now it's dropping again. In fact, in fact, 34, then it went to 41, I believe. I have to check the figures. Now it's gone down back to the 30s. Mr. Gosran, you, you are kind of critical with the Natural Resource Fund bill. Now is now is an act that was passed in Parliament, um, and one of your criticism was that the president's discretion to appoint three board members and also the chairperson. You had proposed that the bill or the act should have two representatives of the accounting profession, one attorney, and one from academia. Are you you are also against the private sector? nominating someone to be as a member of that board. Do you still stand by your comments? Well, I've seen some action um, taken, uh, and I guess because of, uh, because of all the criticisms, not only from me, but from other people. Um, I see Joe Singh now that I, I, support, um, I support the appointment of Joe Singh. Um, why, why I was against the private sector is because uh, the private sector is too cozy with the present government. It is not seen to be genuinely, you know, looking after the, you know, the, the coziness caused me to think, why should we have a private sector commission to nominate when they're so cozy with the government, you'll end up with a, with a representative that is more aligned to the, you know. And so I was against that and I wanted to, my recommendation was based on the the need to have a board that is uh, represent the, the comprising people who have got the kind of background, like accountants, because you're talking about money, uh, lawyer, and things like that. And so that, that is against that background that I recommended. But one. Um, I'm still somewhat unhappy with the private sector representative. I'm still unhappy with the parliamentary representative. Um, the only thing I can say is that I support Joe Singh, you know, for chairmanship, and I have my reservations about the other people. And um, what you just said there, Mr. Gosaran, is I think sometimes in hindsight, um, a present government believes that all future government will act like them. So like you said, you know, Mr. Joe Singh being the chairman, the president appointed two other persons, plus as you said, the private sector and the parliamentary committee appointed one each. And it reminds me of um, President Granger when 
opposition leader Dan Barajag, they submitted him six names for chairman of the elections commission, and he ignored that list three times, only to appoint his own person. So I'm saying the act is there, now that the president can appoint three of the five persons, a future president can appoint three party loyalists to be on that board and no one can say anything about it. And that's the, oh, that's true. That's that's the thing true. that we need to guard against and having professionals, as you said, President Hoyt was in favor of, I think that in my view is the way to go. What do you think? Yeah, we, we need them um, because what's gonna happen, let's say 2025 20, is a change in government. All these things, you know, the new government will, will replace these people with their own kind. And this is why it's, it's so important that um, we strip the politics out of all of this. We take out the politics and, you know, appoint bodies to, you know, uh, go through a transparent process, advertise, put us an independent committee to make the selection rather than the politicians selecting, you know. Have you, have, you, have you been um, invited by President Ali to meet with him on matters of public, um, you know, any matters that he, in, your, in his view, you might be um, competent to advise him on? Well, let me put it this way. Um, the PPP sees me as an enemy of the state. The PPP sees me as a, an enemy, enemy of the state. Like, if somebody comes to my house and so on, and, he, and uh, he's from that party or so, why you go to that guy's house? Why? Things like that. So um, the answer to your question is, no, President Ali has not reached out to me. And that once, once I met him in... Um, when they had a Commonwealth Parliamentary Conference and so on. And we had a little discussion at that time. He was, um, they were in the opposition. I had a brief discussion and that's all I once, once I met with him. So accountability seems to keep, and that's why um, I think Mr. Christopher Ram was on the program and um, we had a, the ambassador to, to um, Washington, Mr. Hines here, and I did mention to him that not only this government, but all our governments, past and present. Um, in opposition, they are your friend. When they get into government, um, they are the custodian of all knowledge and everybody else is making noise. And um, is that your view of all our government or is it, was it different on the height, as you said? Yeah, it's, it was different. Well. Under Mr. Hoyt, I, I was um, I, if, we, if we were to leave out the Hoyt administration and the Cherry Jagan administration, one I think um, subsequently, you know, you know, there's truth in the situation when when you're in opposition, you embrace the critics of the government. And when you get into power, you you see them as enemies of the state. Okay, I would say that yes, this is a, this has been the thinking of all administrations, even under Hoyt. But maybe Hoyt is not thinking that way. They embrace the people. So if you're the point I'm making, then if you're a critic of the government of the day, the opposition will embrace you. When you get into power, when the opposition gets into power and you continue to be the critic of the government, you become the enemy of the state. And it happened in my experience in 1991, I've been experiencing it. It's across the board. Have you ever thought of getting into politics, Mr. Gulseran? Um, let me move away from the politics of race, then maybe I can think about it. Oh. I cannot see myself um, getting into politics to the extent that the two main political parties der oh, derive overwhelmingly political support based on ethnic considerations. I can't be part of this. 
you think the AFC was a opportunity to put that aside, but they became caught up in petty politics? It's not petty politics. Petty. Yes, they had. There was they they there was a ray of hope, but they dropped the ball. Their their um. I won't use the word lust for power. Their eagerness has um, kind of blinded them to what they initially set out. And so they, they turned their backs against all those who gave their support to them. They were so, they, they, so, they so loved the benefits that accrue to them as ministers of the government, they forget. You know, you know she, um, Shakespeare in Julius Caesar said what? Humility is a something, um, you know, humility is something, but when the climber is the uppermost round, turn his back and look at his clouds and ignore the base from which, I think Shakespeare wrote that in, in Julius Caesar, but I can't remember the words. Yeah. Humility uh, is ambitious, ambitious, ambitions, low ladder or something like that, and when the climber goes up, and reaches the top, instead of looking down, look at the clouds and the stars. I didn't do uh, Julius Caesar. I did, I did Henry IV in, class, in school, so I didn't know about Julius Caesar. Um, yeah. But but I think you're right, Mr. Gosran, is that the AFC, um, not the loss for power, but I think they were more for revenge against the PPP. And in doing that, they were subsumed by the PNC and they couldn't do anything. But that's my my view. I might be wrong. Um, before I ask Dr. Rose to to um, to come on, um, is there any hope for Guyana? There's a lot of hope for Guyana. There's a lot of hope. Even without the oil, there was hope. But you had to have governments that put the interests of the people at first. And we have to break the cycle of governments being elected based on ethnic consideration. If we can solve the ethnic problem, Guyana has a Guyana has been held back since in since the since the split in 1955. The PPP split between PP and everybody and then all the supporters gravitated to the two the two camps. And since 1955, we have, you know, we've been like this and we, we're not moving forward. Now, in the 60s, Guyana was ahead of Singapore, Malaysia, and all the Southeast Asian countries in terms of economic development. And look at those countries. Look at those countries. But again, and the reason why we are held back is because of politics based on ethnic consideration. Well, yeah, and also because of rigged election too, because I mean, those yeah. countries did not have rigged elections. So, but again, as you said, I think in my view, um, I think I can come out of this um, ethnic course we are in, if we go back to constituent um, representation. And the, the person, I know Dr. Rose, and I disagree with this, but the person who wins the most vote should not win the seat. It should be the person who wins at least 50% of the vote in that constituent. They will win the seat of parliament. And we should condense parliament to about maybe every 50,000 Guyanese will have one parliamentarian. So that will give us like about 20 parliamentarian, 25 parliamentarian, give them offices. And I think that if parliament can have more say in the administration of Guyana, I think we are on our way to break this ethnic curse. But without that, I think both the PNC and the PP love it as it is, and they're not going to change that. But that's my view. Dr. Rose? Regardless of what electoral reforms we have, whether we go constituency based or, or PR or a combination, whatever it is, come election time, once we have these two political parties that are grounded based on ethnic consideration, come election time, they're going to advocate voting for your own again. And so, how you how are we going to move forward? How are we going to move forward if we can't break the cycle of ethnic voting? Regardless of what electoral system you put in place, 
it doesn't serve the interests of the two major political parties. Uh, let me ask you the question now that it's on most people's mind in Guyana, oil. Do you think the oil contract was a good one, especially with the 2% royalty? <laughs> I wrote so many articles about it. I said that 2% is a pittance. Now, you know, United States last week, Joe Biden signed some new leases of uh, federal lands. Yeah. And the royalty rate moved from 12.5% to 18. 18%. 18%, yeah. yeah. 50%. And we are getting 2%. Now, again, you know what, what had happened there? In, uh, this is my own assessment. In 2015, just before the agreement was signed, I, my own assessment is that, one, we wanted an American company to, to search for the oil in waters that are disputed. And I, I, I shouldn't use the word disputed because the 1899 agreement gave Guyana it, you know, in waters that um, the Venezuelan are, are claiming. So one, the Exxon is an American company. So if you agree to Exxon, give the, the agreement to Exxon to explore, um, then it would act as a kind of buffer against any possible aggression from the Venezuelan government. So that's one. Two, Exxon, can you produce oil before 2020? Because elections are due in 2020. So Exxon might have said, well, okay, you want us to you want us to be a buffer against the Venezuela? Oh yes, we agree. We had planned to produce oil in maybe in 2024. So but if if you say you want us to advance the production before 2020, oh yes, we can do that. All right, sign this. <laughs> All right, sign this. Two percent royalty. Um no taxes. Uh, waive of all taxes and uh, other um, fiscal benefits. Um, and then, okay, uh, we will deduct 75% of um, uh, revenue operating cost. Uh, and then we will share the remaining 25% equally. But there are no ring, ring fencing provi provisions. I wrote about that, so that you know, when, um, you got dry hole and uh, the other kind of where when you explore in this area and you come up with nothing, that's called dry hole. When you explore and you find something that's uh, in commercial ground, so the, you're supposed to ring fence. You can't bring costs relating to dry hole operations into the 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 field that you you you've got oil. Now, the, in the absence of ring fencing agreement, in the agreement, any amount of expenditure can flow into and call and you call it recoverable costs. Secondly, you sign off that um, you agree to pay Exxon 460 million US dollars for pre-contract costs. That is cost incurred from 1999 to 2015. Plus, there is another 500 million between January and June 2015, works out about 900 million US. So we owe Exxon all that kind of money. And um, so we got 2% royalty, which is a pittance. We waive all the taxes, give them all the concessions, and then we will get 50% profit oil. 50% of zero is how much? <laughs> before before we would have Rose asked the question, do you, in your opinion, you think the politicians were taken care of by Exxon? When you say taken care of, can you be a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be uh, called before the courts, but where they am, um, I know that, I know that Exxon is deep pocketed. I mean, their their pockets are very deep. You think they, there were some uh, corrupt practices with our politicians with Exxon? Well, 
Exxon is bigger than any country. And um, they have the power to, to indulge in, um, to get whatever they want and whatever it takes for, for them to get whatever they want. They will not hesitate. Although you have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977. Who's going to who is going to charge Exxon if they breach? Um, where is the evidence? How can you find the evidence? Now, this brings us to the other question. Every year we are supposed to be auditing Exxon expenditure. And up to now we can't get our act together to appoint auditors. And you have, I think, well, two years. Once two years lapses and you don't audit the expenditure, you forfeit the right to to proceed with the audit. So at the moment, from 2016 to date, we haven't had an audit of Exxon's expenditure. Uh, Mr. Golsaran, do you think this government should negotiate, renegotiate the contract? By far, yes. By far, yes. Yeah. We spoke about that. We spoke, we asked, we wrote that Granger administration should have renegotiated. But they didn't. And we we asked that this. In fact, uh, this government promised to renegotiate. Check the manifesto. It states right. that is true. So why do you think they're not doing it? Only they can answer that. Uh, only they can answer that. Okay. Uh, the next question I want to ask you. This government wants to go back to the Amelia Falls project. Do you think that's a good project to work on? Um, one, it, uh, the, the initial project I criticized because it was too, you know, when I look at the, 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 the figures, um, the, it was inflated in my view. Um, I wrote an article about the, the second attempt to, um, to have the Amelia Falls and uh, Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We just have to wait and see. In fact, I'm not sure if I, I offered any kind of criticism of the new arrangement. Or the, um, is it going to be with, with some Chinese company doing it? I have my reservations about um, Chinese involvement. Not that. Not that I'm against China, but. You know, the accountability arrangements and the monitoring and feasibility studies, they are very, you know, the arrangements are so loose, you know. So uh, that's, I, I think that was my concern about the Amelia Falls. And I'm not sure people talk about at some point in time in the year, the falls can run dry. And what's going to happen? Um, people talk about the, um, you know, dislocation of the indigenous population. Now, we got a big problem with the transmission line. Are you going to feed 165 what, megawatts of electricity into the GPL system? And I equate the GPL system is like trying to put water in a basket because close to 30% of electricity generated by GPL is lost through, through commercial loss, through commercial, or uh, they call them commercial losses. Line losses, and yeah. Technical, and technical losses. Now, are you, if at the moment, whatever, whatever our uh, GPL is generated, 30% is lost. Now, when you have 165 coming from Amelia, through Linden, through to, to, to Sophia, and then you pump that into the GPL system. Can it take on the, can, can it take off that amount? Or is it going to explode? As I said, it's like basket fetching water. So if you're going to develop Amelia Falls, and you, you, you have this, you, 165, Megawatts. Of, maybe you need to look at an array. You need to ask the hard question: Is GPL capable of handling taking off that, or whether we should have a new entity outfit? I don't know. 
Uh, Mr. Goldsuran, I want to turn you to healthcare. And I just got a text message here. Someone texted me, said that they went to, to see a doctor this morning at the public hospital in Georgetown. But this is happening all over the country, not only in Georgetown. And from 9 o'clock this morning, she said she saw a doctor around 2.30 this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And yet the government is telling us that their health care system is good. But whenever they get sick, they travel abroad to seek medical attention. That's Why right. is it patients have to wait six, seven, eight hours to see a doctor? Because there is a shortage of doctors. Why the government can't fix that it? problem, rectify that problem. I, I've written about that on several occasions when in connection with the specialty hospital. I said, why? Why a specialty hospital when you, 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 you know, you have the Joshua Hospital in New Amsterdam Hospital, people dying at one time in New Amsterdam Hospital, people were dying and they were lying in the mortuary for days and weeks and months. And maybe the same is happening in in Joshua. Yeah, it is true that when you go to emergency, it's not emergency, you wait four or five hours before you can see a doctor. And you see all these these huge projects, mega projects and fancy projects, you can call them vanity projects, and taking the oil revenues and whatever to, why don't we fix the healthcare system? Why don't we fix the education system? Why don't we fix the security system? You know, I know we're doing some work on the housing part, part but that is a that's also a, another issue. But certainly, instead of building highways, roads, bridges, uh, why don't we take the money, some of that money, and fix our healthcare system? Uh, Mr. Goldstrand, a lot of people didn't know this. I normally get grants and travel to other countries to do research. I went to several. But this year, well, no one gave me a grant to go to Guyana, but I spent almost seven months in Guyana this year because I want to study the country to know what is wrong and so forth. And what I discovered is this. The PNC and the Forest one and brought in the regions and the RDCs and the NDCs and what have you. And the system, that system, I can say this loudly, is actually collapsing. It's not working. And there's been no reform of the system at all in the past 30 years. So the system brought in way back in 1980 under the PNC is still operating now in this, in this 21st century. And if you go to get services from these regions, it's not there. So my question to you is this. Why the government or governments have not reformed the system? How can you allow a system to work, think it's going to work forever like that? Why? Well, again, uh, you know, the regional system should, um, you know, we have central government, we have um, political parties uh, vying for um, political power, and you win. When it comes to regional and local government, these political parties should not have been involved. Let the residents elect people based on their based on merit. But what happens whenever you get local government elections, these political parties go and hijack the whole thing. So it becomes something like central government. And to the extent that um, we have problems at the level of this at central government, it's gonna go there too. And remember we said the party's interest comes first. So when people do wrong things, they, no action is taken. The other thing is that local government accountability in, in a state of massive disarray. Then last you see the city council, Georgetown city council's audited accounts. I don't know. It was issued in 2002, was, 2000 was issued in 2002. That's under my tenure. Since then, Everything ground to halt. After 2000, there are no audited accounts. New Amsterdam, the same thing. The only town council that is fairly up to date is Anna Regina. And you have 70 NDCs. Ask yourself how many have produced accounts since 
since they were established in 19, 93 or when, and how many are, are still to be audited. So the question is, if you're not accountable for your financial and your managerial stewardship, how are you going to be replaced? We don't have the mechanisms to replace officers of NDCs and town councils, the municipal body, unless the people have the say to, re, to you know, if you don't perform well, out you go. No, party politics comes in again. I'm from the quarantine. Mm -hmm. Which part? And on the, and on the pardon me? Which part? Do you know Eversham area? Oh, yeah. Do you know Firish? Yeah, my, my mother family from Firish. I know Firish very, very well. I'm from Firish. Oh, you're from Firish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you should know guys like Harry Ganesh and them. They're, he's from Firish too. Yeah. Now, I'm from the quarantine, and I want to say this to all our listeners and to all government officials. The quarantine has about 100,000 people, roughly. It has one RDC. It has three mayors, one in Amsterdam, one in Rosalton, and one in Curvaton. And it has 18 NDCs and 300 councillors. And yet, there's a wash of problems of the quarantine. Nothing is being fixed there. I was there and I assessed the situation. It's, the quarantine is in a mess. 18 NDCs, 300 councillors, three mayors, and an RDC. And you go and ask the people of the quarantine about the problems. Just last week, the same village I'm from flooded. Flooded. And they just had rain for a day. And got, nobody seemed to find out why it's being flooded. So I'm saying to you, the whole entire system needs to be overall. And a final thing, comment I want to make, and a question as well. The government talks about development, and I support development and so forth. But this government ought to know one thing, that if you want development, you cannot have that same public service. They have to be retrained. No one answers your phone in the public service. Nobody, the landlines, nobody. And you go there, and you're a long line. And when you look in the office, everyone on the cell phone. They're not attending to the people, but the line is so long. And no one seems to correct that situation. Anyone in the public service tells you that they're going to call you back, tell them to their face, you're a liar. They don't call back anybody. I tested the situation on several ministries. And what I found is appalling. And this is what I want the government to know. They've got to retrain public servants. They've got to write the program to retrain public servants, or else you'll not. Public servants are the ones who can stymie your project, stall it, or just melt it away. Any policy you produce to them. And there's too much vindictiveness in the public service. If a PS and you can't get along because you tell the PS of a different something that is different from what he wants, you become his enemy. I've seen this. I've checked it. I've studied the system for the past seven months when I was in Guyana. And it is ridiculous. My question to you, why is it there are so many contract workers? <laughs> Good question. I've written about that, 20%, roughly 20% of well, um, is 27, employment. Well, artists 27% now. The data figures give us 27%. 24% at that time when I was writing, it worked out. Well, it has to do with... It has to do with attempts to have your own people. So you have the regular public service and you have a parallel public service comprising contracted workers. And if you were to do an analysis of the background of the contracted employees, you would realize that they're the 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 party loyalists in many cases. Now instead of reforming and this goes back to the commission of inquiry into the public service by um, Professor Harold Lutchman. Yeah, okay, I read, I read his report, yes. I did five articles on it, and in fact, I went and I testified in front of the commission. 
what should have happened? We should have had a unified public service with uniform pay and grade. And uh, he talks about training. My brother he was also a commissioner on the, he has a HR background. And he wrote a section, I believe, on on training and HR matters and so on. But we need a professionalized, we need a professional public service. You can't, um, for example, the head of the public service is a permanent secretary. He's not appointed by the public service commission, or if he's appointed, it goes through, they go through the motion. The, the permanent secretary is selected by the government of the day, which is wrong. That's where it's all started. So every time there's a change in government, permanent secretaries change as if they're cabinet ministers. Permanent secretaries, the word permanent denotes that governments will come and governments will go, but the permanent secretary has the institutional memory for continuity. Okay. So All that right. is the um, gentlemen, we'll have to, it's, it's program time. I know, Mr. Gosran, you've spent a long time with us. You, you've given us a, quite a bit of information. I think our audience will, um, will dissect what you're saying to them. And I'm sorry, we've got so many other questions to ask you, but of course, time has run out on us. We want to thank you so much for being with us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. Maybe when you run for president of Guyana, we can talk to you again to That's unite that. our people. If you, if that is what you're, if that is what you are thinking of, maybe there might be a, a noble goal, and I think President Ali is trying his best to do that. But as you said, it's a short in his presidency to determine what direction he goes. But again, today is the president's birthday, and we want to wish him all the best. Anything in closing, Mr. Gosaran? Well, thank you for for having me on the program, and um. I'm, I've been reluctant to come on the program. In fact, um, two other times when Sis was there, he asked me, and then I think this guy, Bishram, had asked me, and I declined. But somehow, Dr. Rose was able to convince <laughs> me to come on the program. Um, so I'm glad to be on the program, and I know one of the reasons why I, I tend to be reluctant because there's so many people out there who would want to be critical of what I see, you know. But you'll have to live with that. Okay, well, thank you for being on the program. Dr. Rose, anything in closing? Yes, I received a ton of emails and messages. Dr. Rose, please don't ask for $25,000 for teachers, public <laughs> servants, and so forth. Ask for $200,000 because that cost of living has gone awry. awry. It cost of living is so high in Ghana today. I was told. Uh, things that were selling for $300 a pound gone to $700 now. So $125,000 will not cut it. They're asking me to say they need $200,000 a month. Charles, you've been saying that. <laughs> so, so I'm saying increase public servants, teachers, nurses, and police officers pay to at least $200,000 a month. Give them a decent salary. They're hardworking people. And I'm going back to the internet. GTNT is providing very, very poor service to the people and charging them a leg and an arm. GTNT has got to rectify the system. You're calling someone on, on, on WhatsApp and it's always go off and reconnect and reconnect and reconnect. GTNT has got to do better than that. And the final one I want to say is this all Guyanese should know one thing that they have to come together and unify the country. We can't talk about Indo and Afro Guyanese anymore. We are Guyanese first and foremost, and we have got to promote that unifying concept so that all of us can go forward in peace and unity. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Gosaran. And to our viewers out there, we want to thank you so much. God bless our great country of Guyana. Thank you so much. Amen.